Hey, hello everyone. My name is Gemma Yates. I am Investor Engagement Lead at ACCR and I'll be hosting today's webinar. I would like to start by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, who are the traditional custodians of the land that I'm dialing in from today. And I would like to pay my respects to elders, um, both past and present. Uh, a few housekeeping notes before we get started. The webinar is being recorded today uh, and there will be an opportunity for Q&A at the end of the presentation. So if questions do arise um, while we are going through the slides, please just pop them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So thank you all for joining us today. It's an early webinar for those dialing in from Europe, so we do appreciate it. As I'm sure most of you are aware, and I, and I guess just to provide some background for those that are joining this story for the first time, ACCR, along with HSBC Asset Management, LGIM, Vision Super, and Ethos Foundation recently co-filed a disclosure-based resolution with Glencore that asked the company to demonstrate how future capex and production plans are aligned with the Paris Agreement. Encouragingly, this week, nine additional institutional investors announced their support for the resolution. So I just did want to say up front, if any other investors here today would like to join the Glencore Pre-Declare group, um, please reach out. My contact details are on this slide. Uh, just shoot me an email and we can discuss the details. So with that, let's get into it. Joining me on the panel today is Dimitri Lafleur, ACCR's Chief Scientist, and Naomi Hogan, ACCR's Strategic Projects Lead, who also heads up ACCR's work on Glencore. I would like to now pass over to Naomi to run through today's agenda. Thanks, Gemma, and hi, everyone. Uh, I'll start by briefly running through our key findings of our latest report. Uh, so after the 20. 3% vote against the climate report at Glencore's last AGM, uh, ACCI was very interested to dis, uh, assess this recent climate report uh, from Glencore in March. Now, we found that it fails to demonstrate Glencore's thermal coal business is aligned with the Paris Agreement or that its CapEx commitments are Paris aligned. We also found that despite feedback from a number of investors in the past year, Glencore is persisting in using an IEA net zero emissions pathway that includes all fossil fuels to assess its climate targets. You can see the fossil fuels pathway that Glencore matches its targets against on page 10 of its recent climate report. Meanwhile, investors have sought to track alignment of the coal business, noting that around 90% of Glencore's disclosed emissions are from coal. Based on current disclosures by Glencore and its stated strategy, its cumulative emissions from coal production from now until 2050 do not appear to be Paris aligned. We believe that investors require clearer disclosure on the specific alignment of the coal business. Now, the big bit of the moment, the pro uh, proposed tech merger, demerger and potential coal spin out, it only heightens the importance of greater transparency on how the company's thermal coal production aligns with Paris. Any and all shareholders should be privy to that crucial information. The upcoming votes at Glencore's AGM uh, offer an opportunity for investors to signal support for greater disclosure on coal. We will be voting for the thermal coal production resolution against the climate report and certainly encourage investors to consider your own voting policies when it comes to the directors overseeing Glencore's position on climate. Uh, for today's agenda, we will cover Glencore's emissions, alignment with a coal pathway, an updated look at Wondoan coal to hydrogen, CapEx, Glencore's climate related lobbying, and the tech bid. We'll also address uh, the co filed resolution on thermal coal. I'll now pass to Dimitri for emissions forecasts. Yeah, so Dimitri Lafleur here. Uh, uh, Chief Scientist at ACCR. And um, before I start, uh, I'd like to acknowledge Rowan Bowwater's contribution to this work. Uh, he can't be here uh, to present, but his analysis has been foundational to forming our views. And so I'm presenting this section on, uh, on his behalf. So let's begin by breaking down what Glencore's emissions footprint looks like today. Coal production, and specifically thermal coal, is the largest driver 
uh, of Glencore's emissions. And this slide shows a, the current breakdown of Glencore's disclosed emissions, um, scope one, two, and three for 2021. And we estimate that approximately 90% of the um, Glencore's 280 million tons uh, come from coal production. And as you can see, thermal coal is the key contributor here uh, with an estimated uh, 300, uh, 203 million tons coming from thermal end use emissions uh, alone. So to provide you with a bit of context, uh, when we look at the company's emissions, um, it's really the overall problem um, that we are considering here. How is this important for the world and how is it important for investors? And it really begins with um, uh, where we are today. Um, and that is that the remaining global carbon budget to stay on course for 1.5 degree warming is around 380 gigatons CO2. So the forecasted cumulative emissions of a company are directly linked to that budget. Warming due to anthropogenic emissions will only stop when these emissions reach zero, not when emissions are stabilizing, not when they are declining, but when they reach zero. And currently, global emissions are around 40 gigatons annually, which means that the global budget could be exhausted in less than a decade uh, if we continue uh, as we are. So since it is all about cumulative emissions, it is important that high emitting companies work to reduce their uh, absolute emissions now and in the next decade uh, to, and to have a, a quantifiable plan in place to do so. So with that in mind, uh, let's have a look at um, Glencore's emissions from coal um, and how they may change over time. And there's three key drivers here for Glencore's uh, forecasted emission profile. One is that Glencore has indicated that um, its approach to the coal assets is to continue to operate the mines until they reach the end of their lives. It's also continuing to pursue mine extensions, such as the Hunter Valley. Uh, and uh, lastly, Glencore continues to pursue greenfield developments, such as the One Dollar Project. And the forecasted emissions uh, here in yellow are expected to rise by 3% due to the broadly flat uh, coal production forecast uh, to the early 2030s. Uh, before the expiry of, of the Selichon mine in 2033. And here we factor in all the announced mine closures in the 2022 climate report. And it also, it's also without the uh, Wondowan development. And if you add the Wondowan coal to hydrogen projects, the forecasted emissions follow the, uh, the orange line, the, the dark orange line. So we would expect ambition to bring emissions down in line with the appearance aligned coal pathway. This 3% is in direct contrast with the IEA NZE coal emission pathway, which is the dashed green line, which falls by 50% from 2021 to 2030. Now, this is the same data as the previous slide, but as you know, Glencore uses a 2019 baseline for all its emissions reduction targets. Um, and this is the same graph from earlier, but uh, it, it incorporates the pre-COVID levels uh, of production. And by choosing a 2019 baseline, Glencore can maintain broadly flat levels of production over the next decade, while still achieving that, that production in emissions on the baseline. And this is further amplified by Glencore's intention to rebase their 2019 emissions to incorporate the, the acquisition of the remaining uh, two thirds of the Sadochon mine, which was completed at the beginning of 2022. Uh, Glencore halted production at the Prodeco mine almost immediately post the base year of 2019, uh, which impacted the baseline even further. And so adding all, the em all these emissions uh, together to the baseline, it allows them to meet their 2035 target, which is a 50% target on 2019. So by choosing a 2019 baseline that benefits from their actions of rebasing for Sedagon and not rebasing for Prodeco, uh, setting a 2035 target that comes one year after the expiry of their biggest mine, they are allowing themselves to achieve their targets. But this is more to do with carbon accounting instead of real world emission reductions. So when you compare Glencore's targets with the IEA's coal decline targets for the net zero emission scenario, it suggests that the targets themselves are not uh, Paris aligned. Uh, in 2026, Glencore has an emission reduction target of 50% in contrast to the IA's emissions from coal in 2026, which reduce uh, by 
And in 2035, Glencore has a 50% reduction target as opposed to the IA's 73%. So I want to stress that we are looking at Glencore's coal production. And that is why we are aligning the forecast with the IA's coal emission reduction pathway. Over 90% of Glencore's emissions come from coal alone. And in every credible Paris aligned scenario, coal declines the earliest and the fastest compared to oil and gas. And so it is our view that one cannot justify a claim that a company targets are aligned with a Paris Agreement aligned scenario. When you compare the emission targets, here 90% attributed to coal emissions, to an emission and pathway that lumps together all fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas. Such an emission pathway will decline slower than just looking at coal alone. Uh, we also looked at the latest uh, benchmark data by CA100+. Plus. And for Glencore, um, that updated benchmark shows that the medium and long-term targets are not aligned with the goal of limiting global warming to 1.5. And this is important because uh, Glencore um, recommits to a 1.5 degree objective in its latest um, climate report. So the, the key takeaways here, with regards to Glencore's emissions footprint and its targets, the main message here is that the 2022 IEA global coal emissions pathway for the net zero emission scenario falls by 50% from 2021 to 2030. And in contrast, Glencore's forecast emissions are expected to remain broadly flat uh, from 2021 to 2033. Now to further deconstruct the issue of Glencore's Paris alignment, and as well as the first point of the, of the resolution, uh, let's have a look at the implications of the company's plans to operate their mines until the end of their lives. Just think back of the remaining carbon budget, which is rapidly declining. We are less concerned about when and if a company will reach net zero, but rather what a company's cumulative impact will be in the process. So this graph here includes the forecasted annual production uh, of Glencore between 2019 and 2050. And for reference, this includes what is legally approved at the Bondowan um, uh, site for coal production. This is essentially quantifying Glencore's ambition to exhaust their coal mines by averaging the mine's marketable reserves over its remaining life, taken directly from Glencore's resources and reserves report. And this graph shows Glencore's cumulative production relative to a Paris aligned pathway from uh, 2019. If the colored bar or the colored area um, falls below the X axis, it means that Glencore operations have produced less coal than a Paris aligned pathway since 2019. And above means that Glencore will have produced more coal than a Paris aligned pathway since 2019. In uh, this version, we have taken into account Glencore's recent updates in the climate report uh, of 2022, that Wendoan is expected um, to be explored for a coal to hydrogen project and only utilizing around 4 million tons per annum. And even with this update, this chart indicates that Glencore needs to show greater ambition than it's currently doing, if it is to become a Paris aligned company. This graph shows uh, Glencore's coal production uh, sits very quickly above an IEA net ZE coal pathway, but the chart also addresses how Glencore can align itself with a uh, net ZE coal pathway. And as you can see, Glencore showed good judgment uh, in withdrawing uh, from Valeria, which is in green, uh, which made a uh, yeah, significant positive impact. But going forward, Glencore needs to continue demonstrating this ambition. And there are options around not pursuing Wondowan, Glendale, and the major Hunter Valley operations extension. And this will all contribute to, uh, to alignment. So the main points here are that because we are dealing with a rapidly shrinking remaining carbon budget, it is all about the cumulative impact of a company's emissions towards 2030 and beyond. And this is much more important than when and if they reach net zero. Despite the benefits of selecting 2019 as their base year, Glencore's annual production from 2026 onwards is consistently above the IA-NZE coal-aligned pathway. 
So with that being said, um, I'd like to finish with a bit of context around Wandoan and the role that CCS plays um, in that in a bit more detail. Uh, we have updated this part of the research to include the Climate Report uh, 2022 update that uh, Wandoan, while legally still approved for up to 22 million tons per annum, is now being investigated for the potential to produce hydrogen and ammonia through utilizing a small portion of the Wandoan coal resource, up to 4 million tons, and that would be the feedstock for, this, uh, for the hydrogen. It's unclear what the other plans are for Wandoan, although Glencore says it does not plan at this stage uh, to develop the Wandoan coal resource as a, as a traditional coal mine for the purpose of servicing traditional coal markets. So at this point, we only have very, yeah, relatively flimsy statements in Glencore's climate report on Wandoan. We are providing investors the full range of emission scenarios for Wandoan because it is uncertain what will happen with this project. And the only thing that is known for sure is that it has legal approval to operate as a 22 million ton thermal coal mine. And as a result of this uncertainty, the uh, capex, the production levels, uh, return on investment, and the total emissions of this project remain unclear. So Glencore is in part justifying the pursuit of Wondoan by stating that it will be coupled with uh, carbon, uh, carbon capture and storage to reduce emissions. And it should be noted that CCS is costly and has not been proven on industrial scale. Uh, for Wandoan, we know of two projects, the um, Glencore Surat Hydrogen Project uh, and the CTSCO project. And we'll look in those into a bit more detail. Uh, so firstly, the uh, Surat Hydrogen Project. Uh, so this will involve uh, creating hydrogen through coal gasification, which is one of the most intensive fuel sources on the market. And this graph shows you the relative intensities of, of various fuels. But coal-based hydrogen is by far the most intensive, producing 183 kilos of uh, CO2 equivalent on an energy basis per, per gigajoule. And even if you would couple this with 90% efficient CCS, so a 90% capture rate, which has not been proven to scale, this method would still produce around the same emissions as natural gas on another fossil fuel. And the research by Longdon et al. in uh, last year shows that the emissions from hydrogen through coal gasification with CCS is higher than the low carbon hydrogen threshold that the European Commission is proposing. And this also holds true for hydrogen through SMR, steam methane performing, where emissions are more difficult to capture. And the color shading there shows you the results of the sensitivity analysis on the amount of fugitive emissions, which you also have to take into account. The second project is the um, uh, CTSCO project. Uh, Glencore intends to capture CO2 from a coal-fired power station in Queensland, which will be transported a hundred kilometers, uh, hundreds of kilometers, uh, to a storage facility. And this saved CO2 may also be utilized uh, by Bridgeport Energy for the Mooney Oil Fields um, Enhanced Oil Recovery Project, which I'll discuss in a bit more detail. But in terms of Glencore's Wandoan CCS um, uh, aspirations. Even with an updated project scale to only 4 million tons, Glencore will need to sequester approximately 8.6 million tons per year of the emissions uh, from the Wandoan uh, coal. This is more than the largest uh, coal-related CCS plant in, in operations today. That's the Great Plains Sinfuel plant in the US, which has a capacity of 3 million tons, which is around one third of Wandoan's emissions. And we've also included Gorgon here, uh, which provides an Australian context um, into the complexities of CCS today. Gorgon CCS has a nameplate capacity of 3.4 million tons per annum, and it started injecting in August 2019, three years after the LNG uh, production began. And that was, was supposed to be simultaneously. Injection in the financial year of 22 has reached only 1.6 million tons, which is less than 50% of the intended capacity. And it, it should be noted that Chevron, who operates Gorgon, has a long experience in this department where Bridgeport Energy and Glencore have limited experience and skills in CCS. Uh, and they are also relatively rare in Australia. 
Uh, and another thing to consider is the cost aspect of CCS. And here we show the levelized cost of electricity, the LCOE, for countries currently employing coal-based CCS. LCOE takes the life cycle cost uh, of the energy producing asset and divides it by the total energy produced over its lifetime. Uh, and here you can see that the inclusion of CCS greatly increases the LCOE of uh, coal for countries uh, such as India, China, Japan, and the US. And Australia has the most expensive coal compared to these countries, uh, which has limited uh, CCS experience. So it is likely that the CTSCO project will be incredibly costly and um, the uh, cost of um, electricity uh, is gonna be more expensive. The final point to consider is the CO2 captured by Glencore may be utilized by Bridgeport Energy uh, for enhanced oil recovery in the Muni oil fields. And this involves injecting CO2 into an oil reservoir and thereby increasing the amount of oil that may be uh, extracted. This project will require almost a million tons of CO2, of which around 0.8, just below 0.8, will be sequestered into the ground. And this will yield an additional 1.3 million tons of uh, crude. If you consider the emissions associated with this additional oil, um, that's around 4 million tons of CO2. That's more than five times um, that is sequestered by this project. So ultimately, this project will put more CO2 into the atmosphere than uh, it will sequester. So here are the, the final takeaways uh, for the CCS section. Hydrogen with CCS is still relatively uh, emission intensive. It has not been proven at scale and still produces similar amounts of emissions as on uh, unabated gas uh, on an energy basis. And the LTOE for coal-fired electricity generation with CCS will be significantly higher than um, in other countries that have applied this technology. Uh, and using CO2 for EOR will produce more emissions than it will sequester. And um, I'll now hand over to Naomi, who will take you through Glencore's CapEx allocation. Uh, so on CapEx, uh, historically Glencore has spent around 650 million to 1 billion per year on coal CapEx, which made up about 20% of its total CapEx. However, Glencore has recently announced that it plans to allocate 1.3 billion per year between 2023 to 2025 to coal and oil. Now, the 2021 climate report stated there would be no expansionary capex for energy products, but interestingly, there was no such commitment in the 2022 climate report, rather a statement that capex would support the continued operation of the energy portfolio in line with Glencore's climate commitments. Also, no guidance has been provided for capex beyond 2025, noting the planned Glendale and Hunter Valley operations expansion and the Wondoan project would all commence after 2025. There is a lack of clarity around Glencore's CapEx definitions, which also raises concerns about how its planned expenditures align with the Paris Agreement. The emissions associated with coal expansions and extensions, or coal to hydrogen at Wondoan, are not in line with the 1.5 degree goal. Therefore, more transparency is needed to demonstrate how Glencore's capital expenditure will align with Paris. Uh, I'd now like to talk about lobbying. Uh, climate lobbying has been an increasing area of interest for investors over recent years, as it becomes clear that it's not only what a company says to its investors, it's the policies or lack of climate policy that the company is advocating for that is crucially important. Uh, to whether the world reaches climate targets. Now, the slide here is based on Influence Maps research. They've done a deep dive into Glencore's lobbying activity and the lobby activity of its industry associations. And this information is also incorporated into the CA100 plus benchmark. Their research demonstrates that Glencore's lobbying and advocacy ad activities are not Paris aligned. Glencore gets a D minus for climate policy engagement for both direct and indirect lobbying. And their analysis shows that Glencore has insufficient mechanisms to identify and correct a misalignment. Some examples here, Glencore has advocated for new and expanding coal and gas, 
against regulatory and carbon pricing changes in the EU and South Africa, uh, and sought to weaken reforms here uh, to Australia's climate policy, the safeguard mechanism. The most recent Industry Association review for Glencore shows no improvement on previous years, and Glencore scored 36 out of 100. Uh, on the next slide is a, a list here of industry associations that are found by influence map to be misaligned with the Paris Agreement, yet Glencore did not find any misalignment here of its own uh, industry associations. Now, this is at odds with other major resource companies, for example, Rio Tinto, BHP and Origin have quit or suspended their relationships with the Queensland Resources Council due in part to misalignment with the Paris Agreement. Shell also found it to be misaligned, but Glencore did not. It was notable here in Australia that Glencore came out hard lobbying just a few weeks ago against climate policy improvement here, again, putting it at odds with other major companies who had been supporting the reforms. Uh, and finally, one point on lobbying, an, an example played out here last month. Um, Glencore has been pushing ahead and lobbying for the rejected Glendale Thermal Coal Mine to go ahead. A brief history is that in 2022, the regulator here rejected Glencore's proposed Glendale coal mine expansion due to significant irreversible and unjustified impacts on heritage, both colonial and indigenous. Yet last month, Glencore lobbied against uh, the heritage nomination of the site in pursuit of the mine. This was not communicated to shareholders. Uh, as you can see on the left of the slide here, Glencore's climate report simply said that the mine was rejected, yet Glencore did an interview with a major newspaper here, the Sydney Morning Herald, before the March climate report was released, saying it was committed to the mine expansion, that it was going to fight the heritage listing and talking down the Heritage Council's position. Now, as outlined in our emissions forecast, this mine expansion would produce 135 million tonnes of additional, mostly thermal coal. Uh, so it has relevance here to both Paris alignment and to lobbying. Now I'm going to pass over to Gemma to discuss the tech proposal. Thanks, Naomi. So this is the big deal that has everyone talking. Well, we all know that everything is still in extremely uncertain um, and we know we won't know if uh, the deal will proceed in its current form until the tech separation vote on the 26th of April. Um, it's obviously very, very relevant to climate votes, thermal coal and our ACCR research. So we did want to share some thoughts. Um, as I'm sure most of you know, the Tech Resources Board has rejected the Glencore proposal. Interestingly, as noted in this slide, tech echoed ACCR's concerns uh, that exposure to thermal coal is a material risk. Um, and summarising some of tech's comments, there is no clear plan by Glencore to exit coal. The Glencore proposal is contrary to the tech ESG commitments and thermal coal mines are contrary to the global decarbonisation agenda which would be value destructive to tech shareholders. So given Glencore's aspirations to spin out the coal business, the support of the resolution is, is really more um, important, is, is really important in our view. It's important to note that the coal co would still be Glencore and thermal coal biased. Um, based on 2022 production levels, 84% of the coal co would be Glencore mines and 74% of the coal produced would be thermal coal. So this is not a transformational change in Glencore's coal business. Um, rather, the tech coal business is more of an add-on to the existing Glencore business. The other point to note is that the proposed tech merger announcements did not include any change to Glencore's climate plan. The only material reference to climate change was a statement that Glencore intended to respect the net zero climate strategy tech has announced in the spec of its coking coal business. So to summarise, the tech proposal has highlighted that thermal coal exposure continues to be a material risk for Glencore. Um, there is a persistent lack of trust in Glencore's approach to its coal business, and this sentiment was evident in tech's responses to the Glencore proposal. 
It's also important to make the point that the tech proposal does not change Glencore's thermal coal production pathway or the need for better disclosures. So whatever happens next, voting for the thermal coal resolution is a way to signal to Glencore management um, the need for a clear and reputable the need for clear and reputable information to demonstrate genuine alignment so investors can accurately assess the future risks associated with this business. Thanks, Gemma. Uh, so I just want to talk to the co-filed shareholder resolution a little bit further. In our view, as discussed, the tech proposal makes the thermal coal shareholder resolution even more supportable and timely. All investors, current and future, should be able to have a view on how the emissions from the thermal coal business are tracking going forward. In short, the resolution simply asks Glencore to disclose how its Ford thermal coal production is Paris aligned, how its CapEx for thermal coal is Paris aligned, and if its thermal coal production aligns with the IEA NZE timelines for the phase out of unabated thermal coal for electricity. We think that in light of the tech bid, having on the record disclosure on coal is more crucial than ever. Uh, I've got here the full wording of the resolution, which you can find on our website. As Gemma noted earlier, this resolution has been filed by a global coalition of institutional investors, including LGIM, Swiss-based Ethos Foundation, Vision Super and HSB Asset Management, plus ACCR and Share Action. This is the first time investors have filed a climate resolution specifically focusing on Glencore's thermal coal production. We are seeing some great support for this resolution, including the additional investors coming out and publicly announcing their intention to support the resolution this week. And I've just got a quick slide here um, to give you a, a sort of wrap up of some of the media coverage just from this week. It's clearly hitting a nerve and we do hope we can see further engagement from the company and also really interested uh, if you do want to consider publicly pre-declaring your support to help elevate coal and climate alignment if you're in a position to do so. I'll just summarise some of the key votes that we've been looking at for this AGM. Uh, votes at this coming AGM are clearly very important on the issue of coal and disclosure. We will be voting for the co-filed thermal coal resolution against Glencore's climate report and we really encourage investors to consider the role of Glencore's directors uh, having played their part in regards to governance over thermal coal concerns. I'll pass back to you, Gemma. Okay, so we have, oh, we have quite a bit of time available for Q&A. So uh, if you do have questions, please just put them in the Q&A chat box. Um, so while we are waiting for questions to come through, I thought it would be good to address one topic, Dimitri, um, that we have received a lot of interest in since we published the research. Uh, and that is the transition pathways of the major coal importers or the countries that are currently Glencore's customers. Um, and what those country specific pathways tell us about future coal demand. Um, so if you could maybe just go through that one briefly. That'd yeah, be sure. Do we have that in the slide deck here? Um, so maybe go to the Japan. I think we've got um, a couple of slides. We've got Japan and India. Uh, yeah, great. Yep. Yeah. So Japan um, is a is a crucial market uh, for Glencore, but also for Australia's coal um, in general. Japan is in a in a difficult position uh, with no pipeline, uh, no grid connection to the mainland, and no substantial domestic fossil fuel resources. But uh, Things have starting, started really to change here. Um, in 2021, Japan released an updated uh, strategic energy plan, which showed much more ambition than the previous plans. Uh, Japan's current ambition is to reduce emissions by 50% by 2030 and increase self-reliance. Uh, in the electricity sector, there is much more confidence around what renewable energy can supply uh, which results in a faster decline of, of uh, coal use. Uh, and so the current plan suggests uh, coal will only generate 19% of uh, electricity demand in 2030. And the demand in 2030 is similar to in 2019. So we're looking at a 40% decline in the electricity sector. Uh, this week, the G7 talks have just been wrapped up in Japan. Um, and the main message there was 
how energy security and the energy transition are working together, not against each other. Uh, there was a lot of emphasis on uh, the additions of uh, solar and wind, but there was no mention of coal. And specifically for Japan, uh, Japan is diversifying its coal imports away from the very expensive Australian coal. Um, the lower costs outweigh the cost of the higher volume you need for lower quality coal and um, the cost around uh, ash handling. Uh, also, Tokyo is mandating solar for all large scale home builders. Uh, currently, 4% uh, of Tokyo has solar that could have solar. So there's some real significant um, things happening in, uh, in Japan. Um, another country that I'd like to mention is um, India, which uh, yeah is also here. India is, a, is an emerging market. Um, and in terms of thermal coal in, uh, imports, uh, yeah, there, there, are, there are definitely some changes uh, afoot. Um, it's, a, it's a big coal importer, but also in terms of absolute quantities of coal, uh, it is a market where, um, where demand could grow uh, in a 1.5 degree world. Uh, India's 2030 pledge, um, its latest uh, national determined contribution, is a 45% reduction in emission intensity. Uh, it wants to generate 50% of electricity from non-fossil fuel sources, as well as uh, 500 gigawatts uh, of non-fossil uh, installed capacity. The Central Electricity Authority, uh, the CEA, which is the, the Indian AIMO, um, has modeled what that would look like. And it came to the conclusion that India will need more coal, but that the growth comes from domestic production. Imports remain fairly constant and are projected to be below pre-COVID imports, which were around 70 million tons per annum for the, the electricity sector. And so the backbone of the electricity grid will be non-fossil fuel, uh, fossil fuel uh, generation. Uh, and that has all to do with that India has the second cheapest solar in the world and the cheapest utility scale solar, uh, which is why there's such a drive uh, for solar. And only this quarter alone, India has installed four gigawatts of solar and wind. And over the entire 2020, 2022, 92% uh, of the capacity additions were solar and wind. And India is tracking behind on the installed capacity targets but its plan really showed that there is no growth for uh, coal imports in this market. Excellent, thanks Dimitri. Um, well, we have probably one more question for you. For the IEA coal pathway, um, I think the question is what's included in it? So is it only for coal production or is it for other emissions, including coal burning to generate power? So what we're looking at is um, the, uh, demand for thermal and coking coal. So the IA has, has two uh, pathways for that. Um, and given Glencore has such a big uh, thermal uh, coal um, portfolio, the thermal coal uh, targets and uh, pathway is far more important. So we weighted uh, what has to happen to global coal, uh, thermal coal and coking coal uh, demand and overlaying that to, uh, uh, to understand what should happen with uh, Glencore's uh, thermal coal production. We've got one more here, probably one for you, Naomi. If ACCR has done this research, do we even need Glencore to disclose its coal forecast? So, Thanks, Gemma. Uh, look, I'd say to that that obviously ACCR has done its best here to look at all of the publicly available information from Glencore uh, map out the mine closures that would be planned based on its production and reserve data uh, and map that out going forward. But it's crucially important that investors get the best quality information firsthand from the company uh, and discloses uh, clear, consistent, um, and, and that's, what, that's what this resolution asks for. That's what um, our, our research can certainly prompt Questions and we hope it's useful for investors to take this and to be able to talk to Glencore, to talk to companies where we produce research, uh, to talk about those emissions forecasts and to better understand them. But ultimately, we feel that it is up to companies to clearly disclose their forward emissions and disclose how they will make sure that their forward emissions genuinely align with the company's own climate commitments. In this case, that uh, commitment to the 1.5 goal of the Paris Agreement um, and that that is clearly on the table for all investors and stakeholders. 
um, and any potential future shareholders in the case of the tech bid. Okay, sorry. So, Dimitri, there is one that has come through. You've mentioned Japan and India's pathway with respect to imported coal. I'm wondering if you could comment on the pathways for Southeast Asian nations that are reliant on coal, e.g. Indonesia, Indonesia, etc. I'm a bit surprised by Indonesia. I mean, Indonesia is, an, is a massive coal exporter. Um, I don't think they import coal for their own uh, use. Just looking at the absolute quantities, the, the biggest importer is China. And um, even in the Chinese market, there is, uh, there, there's some real uh, changes afoot in terms of the reliance of imports. And so there was a research done last year that, that looked at what China is developing to sustain its, uh, its energy needs. And just the, 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 um, the, the, the increase in infrastructure to uh, get more access to its mines, uh, to use its own uh, coal reserves, uh, far outweighs um, the reliance on, uh, on imports. So even there, uh, I would, um, is my, my view would be that it's gonna be less reliant on coal imports. Gemma, while we're waiting, um, there's one further slide that uh, myself and Paul from our team put together today, just thinking it might be valuable for uh, participants here. Uh, if we can jump to uh, slide 50 on the deck there, I just wanted to talk about, we had also heard from Glencore uh, first in December last year and reiterated in the climate report out last month uh, that it is closing 12 mines. Um, and it's good to see after some engagement in December where those 12 mines weren't listed, uh, we got there on the right of this slide, you can see the statement there around the coal mines that they intend to close before 2035. Uh, we checked this against the data that we were using for our, our projections, um, and it aligns with that in terms of we had already taken into consideration these mines closing before 2035. And uh, most of these are closing because they have a plan end of planned mine life based on reserve uh, depletion. But what we're not seeing is the data behind and does that mean that Glencore's Ford coal production is Paris aligned? So we're still seeing um, a lack of information there. We're at least getting the, the names of the mines now and we can track them. And yes, they are set to close before 2035. Uh, but as we can see, when we look at the full portfolio of Glencore's mines, as we've projected for it, uh, that still means that we're seeing fairly flat production uh, between now and 2033 in particular, right at a time where we actually know that to reach Paris alignment, we need to see a reduction. So our concern is that we're still not seeing that Paris alignment. But again, very enthusiastic for the company to be able to come forward and, and give more disclosure and show investors how it can be Paris aligned for its coal business. Excellent. Well, <clears throat> we don't have any more questions, so we might um, wrap it up a little bit early. Uh, I just want to take uh, I just want to take the time to thank everyone for giving us an hour of their mornings, um, and we will let you get back to your day. Uh, if there are any questions at all, please just reach out um, to me or Naomi or Dimitri um, and we'll answer any follow-up questions. Uh, also happy to talk about the pre-declare group if, uh, if that is something that interests you as well. Um, so thanks everyone and have a wonderful day.